Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I am of the stars. And this is a bit of a continuing discussion on the topic I was uh, mentioning the day before yesterday. It had to do with the eighth chakra up above the head and a directorship of the astral stories. And uh, I had sort of started to talk about it in the other video. But uh, today I thought I'd continue that discussion so that so that we can get a better handle on those astral stories and start to create co-create very positive astral stories for hum humankind and this is because once a number of us just like a flock of souls agrees on a particular astral story it'll start to change everything in the in the universe everything so um the only thing is, uh, this being the turning point, and what you might say the nadir, the turning point into the light, um, it, it's hard to get the, um, the consensus together. A number of wonderful light workers have been doing great work in visualizing, but so far we're not getting a tremendous amount of consensus at the same moment in time and in the same timeline to put the, like the, the oomph of what they used to call, how did it go, manas, desire and thought together to co-create that reality in the physical sense. Um, but it's, it's just around the corner now, I think. So the thing that's been in the painful process of leaving since it seems like a, an age that this has been happening for the last year and a half or so is that the notion of grouping is changing. No, there are a lot of aspects to this. People uh, in their current state of uh, dark and lightness, duality. And by dark and lightness, I mean lack of awareness combined with awareness or segregated in some way from awareness as the unconscious mind. In this current state, they're not recognizing the fundamental uh, value uh, that that the notion of the all represents in this solar system and in this universe. So grouping, it, what grouping really is, is the fr uh, fragmenting of the notion of the all into tiny little bits and pieces, each little bit being a group of souls that feels that it is the all. And they go by various names. It might be the name of a religion or a country. Uh, it might be the name of a, a, a certain demographic segment of society. Um, we have incredible imaginations at, at the idea of forming groups. And so in the past, until 2012, What's been happening is that people have formed these groups and, and censured or outcast or ostracized people that don't fit the norm for that group. And they f form like a consensus in the astral plane amongst themselves as to what truth is. In a group that practices polyamory, then, then a qualification for being in the group might be being a couple, a straight couple, that enjoys polyamory and like what, what is known in the country and western terminology as swinging. I think that's it. And so a person who is single, whether a man or a woman, and who attempts entry into a polyamory group will be most likely solidly rejected and cast out because they don't fit the important like guidelines or, or norms for being in that group. That's just one example. Uh, I was just down at the border of the United States and Mexico uh, yesterday, yeah, 
the day before yesterday. And um, I could see all along the way there, there are these cities that half of the city is in Mexico called by one name and the other half of the city is in the United States called by a completely different name. And, and I was at one such city. And when I looked uh, down the street, what I could see was this long fence and the houses on the other side. And the feeling uh, was just incredibly like tents there. There were border patrol, uh, quite a lot of border patrol going around everywhere. And, and the people were, you know, some spoke excellent Spanish and some spoke excellent English and some spoke were very excellently bilingual. And so, but the, the feeling was that, that, uh, that we in America were a particular group and those people on the other side of that fence were a group of people that were completely different from us. Now, isn't that peculiar? That's grouping, country grouping. I could feel, you know, intuitively, I could feel at that location uh, like a scar deep into the earth of uh, Gaia's like longing to return to the all. That's country grouping for you, you know? And it gives rise to all kinds of, like, newospheric tensions along the line of the border and for about, oh, 20, 25 miles on the far side, probably on the other side, too. So, then you have, here's a good example, Christianity. I really, I really love Christ as an example of the way to live my life. And, uh, but I don't have a, a lot of beliefs around my, my feeling, my love of Christ um, that, that separate me into a particular group of Christians. Okay, so, um, but in the, in the subconscious newosphere, in the shadow side of the newosphere of Christianity, there are an incredible number of beliefs like that, just incredible, that pit one Christian against the next Christian, one pastor against the next pastor, and so on. So, so that is another example of the dissonance to which the new sphere is subjected by the grouping that is leaving Earth. Okay, so one of the... Um, characteristics of the all is that on the astral plane as our awareness as humankind expands into the astral plane we become aware of the the astral chatter of everybody on earth all humankind and the and the human practice of of separating out certain segments of humankind into ostracized groups into groups that are considered to be, say, unworthy of socializing with the mainstream of the world, or who are considered to be, for some other reason, um, like Molokai, for instance. The feeling of that uh, colony in Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is a beautiful place, beautiful islands, but there was a problem a while back with the, with, with, with the disease of leprosy, and they didn't have a cure. And so they would take um, people, who, the minute they knew that they had leprosy, and they would put them on the island of Molokai, a leper colony, and, and leave them without means of, of going anyplace else. So the notion was that then uh, these people were physically separated from the rest of humankind. Uh, so great advances have been made in the treatment of leprosy. And so now I believe, as I recall, there's quite a, a simple cure for leprosy, whereas before it was a fatal disease. And, and that's kind of true for, for the groups of people that are treated as if they were lepers today. And among these, we have the emotionally imbalanced people and the mentally imbalanced people that are segmented away in institutions all over the world. We have also 
the criminal element, the criminal mind, what they say. People who have been um, left in correctional facilities. Yeah, it, when I was growing up back home in the backwoods, actually, of Maryland, out in the country, um, there was, by, as a crow flies, a jail not too far away in the nearest small town because it was a county seat, right? And security there was not so good. <laughs> and so more often than I can remember in my childhood, there were jail breaks. And, and so as the crow flies, there was no road that went to that jail directly, but as the crow flies, it was not so many miles, seven miles from where we lived. And when the, when they were, when the um, inmates would break out of the jail, they had like a... They had like an alarm system. It was like a, a siren that they sounded, and you could hear it all the way to our house, through the woods, over the cow pastures, everywhere. You could hear when there was a jailbreak. And I remember my mom used to say, she'd say, now you children, come on inside, and you stay here until they catch that criminal. <laughs> and so, sooner or later, they usually caught him, pretty much caught him. And so, there was that segment of society of what you would call the, the inmates of a correctional facility, yeah, that was segregated from the rest of humankind because of the way that they behaved in, 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 and it, how it, did, it clashed with that of what other people considered to be the right way of, of interacting with society, you see. So there you have mental institutions and correctional institutions. And to this, I would add, not in the same vein, but also as a segregational issue, institutions such as hospices that house the terminally ill. Um, uh, I think because it's such a sad event when people are passing on, uh, here in the United States, unlike some other countries, um, the, the people who are terminally ill t often get tucked away into these institutions and hidden from the public eye. So, so what happens when the clear chatter of everyone all over the world can be heard just by me? And, and I might not necessarily have the ability to, um, to block this kind of chatter. So this takes us back to the discussion of the eighth chakra above the head. Okay. What, if we're aware of this eighth chakra, if we're aware of who is directing the astral um, stories that we're hearing during the day, then we will know if the person directing it is from a mental institution or maybe an outpatient with um, an imbalanced emotional body. We will, we will be able to direct that person to those of us on the, on the uh, astral chatter channels who, who are capable of have training in dealing with this kind of thing, such as psychologists and psychiatrists, spiritual counselors, and so forth. Because people with those kinds of imbalances are going to need special care. And, and it's important for them not to direct other people's astral stories at these times, okay? And in addition, we have had a number of incidents of, of people housed in uh, correctional facilities who have, you know, a, quite, a, quite a diverse inventory of uh, like arrest records and so forth who have taken over up here from time to time. And, and so the astral stories when, that, that are, play out when that happens are um, kind of shocking and overwhelming to normal, what the, you would call people with normal notions of criminality. And so we need to refer these people, these people who are like taking over up here and who have uh, the, the personality traits of, of the, what they call the criminal mind, you know. Um, we need to refer them to people who can deal with them. And that, in my experience, is very often the uh, wardens of uh, correctional facilities. 
you know, there are a lot of stories out there about wardens and how 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 uh, tough they have to be and like that. But there are also quite a few good stories about wardens. I think they're much better trained today than they were in the past in dealing with people whose um, behavioral patterns uh, don't match the norm for society. And they're much able to roll with the punches, as it were, because that kind of toughness that you sometimes encounter at a correctional facility needs a particular kind of um, behavioral counseling. So my idea is that when we run into that, we can, we can ask for help from the, from the wardens of the institutions where these inmates stay. Um, so the whole idea is uh, to, to get help from people that are, that are trained to help these particular segments of society because we are not immune to these people anymore. To, uh, we are, and our children, even from the age of one up, are affected by these astral stories. And it can be very detrimental if they go on in a negative vein. It can be detrimental to the child's understanding of this reality. So, so I'm asking that instead of uh, like treating people badly just because they seem to be, what you may say, misbehaving on the astral plane, isn't going to help much because we're all members of the all now, see? And so we have to find help for them. That's the whole thing. Help is available. We just have to figure out who is able and who is willing. The same thing is true of the terminally ill. You know, in the past I've tried, uh, I've participated in a number of sequences, uh, astral stories where people were passing on into the astral plane and leaving their bodies behind. And, and I do my best under those circumstances, having read what I could of the um, art of theosophy and uh, notions uh, of the astral realm, such as are found in, in Arthur Powell's compilations, um, especially his book, The Astral Body. So I've learned enough to be able to help some with an understanding of what's to come for people who are passing from form into the astral finer form. Um, but I'm not really an expert, you know, and it kind of tears me up to be dealing with, with people who are terminally ill. I suffer with them and instead of offering the kind of dispassionate advice that will be most helpful. I offer the kind of advice that, that kind of hurts my heart, you know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not neutral enough. And, and yet there are many people who are that neutral, you see. So if we're dealing with that kind of story, we need to ask on the astral plane for the experts. That's what I think. I'd like to talk too a little about the ivory tower folks, the researchers and the doctors and so forth. Um, the people that hold power, but not like necessarily um, the kind of power, physical power they hold, intellectual power and intellectual schemes in their mind that are used to help model social behavior and also to develop the body of knowledge of humankind. These people are used to a kind of power and part of it is financial because they get paid more than those of us who are day laborers and so forth. And yet, they also are part of the all right now. And, and in the deepest sense, every human soul in the all is worth just as much as every human soul and contributes just as much to the body of knowledge we call the Neurosphere and its clearing. So this is going to take some understanding. This is going to take some readjustment, I feel. Because those with power and status along those lines are used to like um, holding, holding court and, and uh, having sway over the minds and hearts of other people. We are no longer holding sway. Holding sway has no longer any meaning. We are all great and beautiful hearts within the all, each contributing according to its own passion to give 
to humankind. And so it may feel like for those that are used to the kind of strength and power that the ivory tower gives us, it may seem like we are losing something by acknowledging the all, yes? But we are not. We will find that the, that the reality that we co-create is so much richer and more abundant for all humankind, so much more beautiful and, and fulfilling for our own selves and our own careers, that it will be well worth it. That moment of insecurity, that moment of, of wondering what's going to happen next, will it be as good as it was before, will, will be overcome in the, in the understanding of what's before us, the wonders that are before us. This is honestly the case, I feel. Yet I understand that those who are, in st terms of status, above other people, would have that moment of wondering, will I have as nice of a house? Will my wife still love me? Will, will I have that wonderful of a career? Will people look up to me when others also rise to their own sense of personal power? See, that's the question. What will it be like? And from that question, from that, that wondering, we can turn to the possibilities and the answers that are, have been until now beyond conception. I have more to say, and <laughs> this has to do with the young people. The young people are getting into the conversation, and sometimes we recognize what you might call imm immature emotions and immature evaluations going on, and they're directing the play. Very young people might be directing the play. They might be taking on sexual characteristics which are just like programming that, uh, rote programming that they've picked up from their parents, you know, or like that. And so they can confuse us about what's going on, all right? So what we have to do, we ask. We hear the astral story, we ask, how old are you? <laughs> and when we get the answer that we're talking to young people, the less than the age of young adults, then we refer them, let us say, to their teachers at school, if they're at school, or to their parents if they're at home. In other words, we f refer them to the people that can help them with their schooling and their understanding of the astral plane uh, through the physical interaction that they have with them by talking to them, okay? So there's that, the young people. <laughs> and there are many other categories. They're the category of people who are just very rich. Let's take the very rich or the very powerful. Um, there are some people like that who are used to getting their way no matter what, you know. And, and so it's not really true because they're living their lives and they're going to pass on just like everyone else. They experience the hardships of everyone else, but in their mental filter, in their understanding of who they are, they see themselves as invincible and they enjoy the notion of always getting their own way. Hmm. I think the thing to do in this instance is to keep one's own electromagnetic field always as, as strong and as beautiful as possible. Because when our electromagnetic field is strong, like through the practice of yoga and so forth, when it's strong because we are living less stressful lives, we're eating as well as we can, and we're getting plenty of rest and so forth, when we take good care of ourselves and, and listen to our own hearts, then people just naturally like us, you know? People just, just naturally don't want to, to cause us any harm and to get their own way like that. But if they do, I think the thing to do is just to compliment them and tell them that they're very much appreciated and very much cared for and so on. Because all souls, all souls long for that. They long for 
the nurturing and the love of uh, and loving kindness. Yes. And along those lines, the Buddhist prayer is very helpful to say, to say um, may, may all beings have plenty to eat. May all beings be happy. May all beings have a good place to stay. May all beings be healthy and so on. To include everyone in that. Okay. So, so basically, so basically, we are as a society, mainstream society, as we become used to the astral chatter, are beginning to understand, especially if we place our awareness above the, the, the head at the eighth chakra, we're beginning to understand the nuances of the socially outcast, of those that we have compartmentalized and segmented away from the mainstream. And we're beginning to understand that they are part of us. They are part of humanity. And we are beginning to, to, to treat them not as outcasts, not as ostracized people and so forth, but as part of the all, as a valued part of the all, an important part of the all with something to contribute that we will find out about, you know. And we're beginning to, to find for each human being the kind of help that's needed for them to ascend. As they say, souls ascend one by one. And so, the clearing of our own personal electromagnetic field above the head, concentrating on the heart chakra, and developing the electromagnetic field is really the answer to all the worries and fears and concerns that people begin to experience as they expand outward into the astral plane and once more refamiliarize themselves with the concept of the all. <laughs> well, so, long talk. <laughs> Y'all take care. Love you lots. You're the greatest. Till next we meet.